Hello, friends, and welcome to my final show for 2023. Uh, for the last couple few months, uh, I was dedicated to putting out a show every Saturday at 6. This will be the last show that is a Saturday at 6 show specifically. Uh, from now on in 2024, my plan, at least for the foreseeable future, will be to put out a video when I think of something really cool that I want to get off my chest and see what y'all think about. So uh, thanks for watching this. This is actually something I've been noodling on for over a year. And I guess this is its first real public release, this idea. Uh, it, it still needs some fleshing out. So if you, if you have any ideas about it or feedback, good or bad or whatever, please write it in the comments. Um, let me know your thoughts as I continue to kind of work on this idea. And, and it's not something that's going to solve all the problems of the world. Uh, I, I'm just I think that this P problem could be eh, a good way of looking at things. And so this is kind of a combination of several ideas. The first is uh, Michael Malice talked about the cathedral. It was the first time I'd heard it, it mentioned. And cathedral being this group of, I guess, professors uh, or, you know, colleges, higher education and churches and the press or something like that, or maybe the government. And, and I kind of just went a little further on this idea and developed some of my own. And I'm also kind of looking at the 80-20 rule, Pareto's principle. The idea that 80% of the problems in the world are caused by 20% of the people. Um, and then of those 80% of problems, if you took the most important part of those, it just kind of narrows it down the 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 20% of the 20%, the 80% of the 80%. It just kind of really boils down to there are very few problem people in the world. There are very few uh, bad guys out there. Most of us are pretty good. Uh, maybe some of us are dumb. Maybe some of us are dogmatic. Maybe some of us aren't very creative or hardworking. Like we have our little issues, but truly bad people who mess up the whole system or mess it up for everybody else, there aren't that many of those folks out there. Um, and many of them, I'm going to say, you know, they don't think they're being bad guys. And so I don't really want to come down on them. I'm just kind of calling them out as they are part of the problem. And as I talk about each of these P groups, uh, I want to clarify that not everyone in that that group of people is necessarily bad. Um, I'm saying the general, the, the, the most of the people in that group are the bad ones. So let's start out with the first uh, of this list of P's, the, the, the problem people, uh, are politicians. And when I say politicians, I mean... I, I, that's kind of a rough term. I mean, presidents of countries, kings, queens, governors. I, I live in the United States uh, jurisdiction. So a, a governor, a senator, a state senator, a, a national senator, county commissioners, city councilmen, uh, all of those kind of elected people, uh, I would consider them politicians. And then I'm also going to toss into that group kind of the bureaucrats that are at the very top. Um, so the town, uh, there's the, the town government might have a mayor and a, a bunch of council members or a handful of council members, and then they hire a city manager to do their bidding. So I'm going to include the city manager. I'm not going to include department heads or such. Um, I think those are kind of different, but I'm just including that top crust of, of people in the political class, politicians. The second group of P people who I don't care for are the press. Uh, and when I say press, I don't mean the the innocent person who goes out looking for an interesting story that they can share that the rest of us or some of the rest of us want to look at. I'm talking about CNBC, Fox, uh, New York Times, all of the, I've heard it called legacy media or corporate press or corporate media. Um, these organizations who are, just kind of all in the same big club. So I'm not including in this uh, the uh, independent little person who is is writing articles about things that happen in their community and, and they're not being told what to do or what to write about. And they're just kind of finding things they think are interesting and offering them up to the world. I, I'm not saying those folks are bad. So it's it's particularly the big corporate press that uh, that I'm I'm calling out here. Next in my group is uh, next per, next group of people are professors, and, and I expand this not only to be college professors, but also school teachers and such. Uh, and I'm I'm going to take some people out of this group. 
so I don't think that a private school teacher who is teaching math, uh, that person is not necessarily the problem. I'm talking more about the soft stuff that is taught by most universities. Um, the, the, the crap about, you know, you got to love your government and go fight for them and, and uh, all the, all the soft stuff, the stuff that isn't real true stuff. Like uh, somebody who's teaching someone how to be a veterinarian or how to be a physician or, a uh, plumber or something. I'm not including those people in the in the bad guy professor group. Um, but I'm just saying the person who works for a government college or actually for any college that is accredited, um, who is just teaching junk about, you know, the underwater basket weaving and how it affects Native American lesbians, you know, whatever the, all these classes that have nothing to do with making stuff happen in the world. Um, now, I, I don't have a problem with somebody who likes weird, different, interesting stuff. I like weird, different, interesting stuff. And so I don't have a problem with somebody offering this up, but when it's a kind of an organized big thing, like a state university who's teaching a, uh, a gender studies class, like those are the people who I would be at the top of the bad heap when it comes to professors. The, the person who's teaching real life useful stuff, um, th those folks I'm, I'm not including in this, this group of distasteful folk. Next are priests and preachers, and this is the group of kind of the organized religion. Um, so, you know, Episcopals, Presbyterians, Baptists, Catholics, uh, any Mormons, any of the bigger religions, the people who lead them, even if they really believe in what they're saying, um, the, the people who are, are leading the church, so to speak, and are still pushing the agendas. And I'll just take Episcopal Church, for example. And Episcopals, are, they're kind of a branch of the Democrat Party or of left-leaning socialism, not social, Marxism. And, and there's nothing wrong with having those interests, but those that priest or, or that clergy person in, in that church or any of the others who is pushing beliefs that aren't based on their their cult or religion or their whatever it is, uh, that is that's that's a group that I'm not caring for. Now, a person who really truly believes in burning witches or in resurrections or whatever they whatever religion it is, if they really truly honestly believe in that stuff, and they simply want to share what they believe to be an important truth with their neighbors far and wide, and they go and they they preach it, and of course they need to get paid somehow. I don't mind them collecting tithes, and you know as as long as it's an open, honest thing happening, then I'm all all good about it. Um, but I I know there's some of these churches that are nationwide Christian churches where it's a complete money making business, and you know you work in the you have to have a sermon every so often about how important tithing is and and how you've got to support your government and blah blah blah, and it's just that's the priest and preacher that the uh, class that I have a problem with. Next group is the populace. These are the folks who kind of play along with all the other P's. Um, and so I would say I used to be a Rotarian and, and so the Lions Club, Boy Scouts, PETA, uh, Conservation Alliances, Elks Club, uh, Council for Foreign Relations, United Nations, uh, World Bank, all those kinds of folks. I'm putting those people all in the same category that that they're they kind of make up a big portion of the the moneyed or the powerful people. And I'm not saying the filthy, filthy, rich people. And filthy is a bad way of describing wonderfully wealthy, but uh, I, I'm talking about the person who is the, the manager of McDonald's who is in the Lions Club. Oh, that's kind of a community leader kind of person. I mean, that's better than the person who works at the video rental place uh, part time and uses a bunch of the heroines or whatever. Like they're kind of just the, the, the Lions Club, the, the Rotary, all these ones I mentioned. I'm calling those folks the populace. And finally, I'm going to talk about planners. So all the other P's that I've talked about, uh, they're not really the the decision makers. Um, it, it's not like some senator or some president uh, of some country is really truly making the decisions that move the needle in the world. I mean, they're making little tiny stuff, but they're not the true P 
people who are planning out what's going to happen. Now, I don't know, and I don't want to get into conspiracy conjecturing about how it's the Bilderbergs or the the Gates family is is planning everything, or the I forget who some of the other ones. Are. I don't know who it is. I, I don't know if it's three big families who do it, and they're all tied to Catholicism or Freemasons, or they're all Jewish, or I I don't know. Um, I I would guess that if I was really wealthy um, and I came from many generations of wealth and like we had more money than uh, anybody else, you know, hundreds of billions. And, you know, we giggle when we see someone like Elon Musk or Bill Gates and, oh yeah, people think they're the richest. Yeah, they're the richest. I mean, I'm talking the top crust of people who we don't even know about who have a ton, or maybe we do know about them. Um, those folks are the planners who really, truly really make things happen. They're the ones who decide if the United Nations is going to win their little tussle they're having with the World Economic Forum um, for who gets to be the central planner for the world. Uh, I don't know who those top people are, and I'm not going to claim to. I think anybody who thinks they know uh, it's hard to get beyond conjecture. It's hard to get a, a, even a hypothesis built on it. And I haven't seen any hypotheses that have withstood getting to the next level, which would be a theory. Um, there, there are little bits and pieces of evidence that it's great if it makes you suspicious. It does make me suspicious, but it's not enough that I can, you know, kind of just say offhandedly, I think that the, you know, the Rockefellers are behind this. I don't know. I, I don't know. The, yeah, there are lots of little clues, but I don't know. So I'm not going to make those blanket statements. Okay, so of these groups that I've talked about, these P's, they make up less than 5% of the world's population. And yet I think that they're probably making 95% of the real material big decisions. Like they're deciding if there's going to be a big sustainability agenda that is that the world is going to be into for 20 years or 50 years or whatever, or if there's something else that the world needs to panic about. They're the ones making the big, huge, real decisions. And 5%, you look at 5% of the world's population, that's still quite a few people. Um, but it's not very much, obviously, uh, compared to the other 95% of us who are not in those roles. And of course, the, the people in those P's that I mentioned, uh, you know, a low level Rotary Club member, the, the assistant manager at McDonald's who's in Rotary Club, they're not wielding the same power as the president or grand Pumbaa or whatever what they call the, the United Nations person or the World Economic Forum. They're, they're not wielding that kind of power. And I, and I don't blame that poor Rotarian who's just a member. Um, yeah, I'm not, not placing the same blame equally on all of these groups or on the, the individuals within these groups at all. So then the question is, how do these P's all work together? Why does this matter? Why did I outline each of them? Well, let's get into how I think it probably works. And there's another P for my alliteration, my P alliterations. No idea why I did this big P alliteration thing. I guess there were just several that were stacking up and so I decided to do that. Um, so if we're looking at the highest level of people, the planners, they are the string puller, pullers. They are the ones who make the decision and then send the orders down the pipe uh, that make things happen. And I, I really hesitate to believe that there is a huge conspiracy. And I know that people conspire or join together to plan things, uh, but I, I, I'm not persuaded that it's that it is all one big plan by one group and then everybody else is following along and knowing that they are looking up the chain to this person who is at top and like, oh, well, the Rockefellers said we needed to have a sustainability panic for, you know, 50 years to, you know, reduce the population. And I don't know that it's coming down like that. I, I really hesitate to do that. I don't want to be a conspiracy conjecturist nut. Um, however, I do imagine how it could work. And so I'm just going to go through a little brain exercise here. Join me if you would. Let's say that you and me, we each come upon $200 billion. And 
we have this money and we take a year or so and we're like, whoa, this is really cool. And we, we buy yachts and jets and we travel and we buy cool stuff and, and we donate money and we do this, that, and the other thing. And we're, we're loving it. And, and we kind of get it out of our system. And when we realize, Hey, we're still putting our pants on like everybody else. We're still normal people. And so then after we've had our, our crazy time, now we're calming down and imagine we got together and we said, you know, we both have a lot of money, don't we? And having this money has given us really cool stuff. Like we've gotten to meet a bunch of people. When you have a ton of money, you end up meeting some really interesting people. You're meeting Elon Musk and, and presidents and congressmen and, and Fortune 1000 company owners and sports figures and, and inter, other entertainers, singers, etc. You're kind of rubbing shoulders with them. You're going to the same restaurants, the same high-end country clubs and the same hotels. And you're bumping into these people and kind of getting to know and, and, and friends introduce you to other friends. And you have a whole new set of people who you know. And this is really neat. But now we have the money. We've calmed down a little bit. And we're hanging out together. And we're like, hey, this is really cool. And we have it made now. This is, this is neat. But there are billions of other people in this world who are really living crappy lives and man we want to help and and you know money wouldn't last long if you just gave everybody enough to retire you gave everybody that you could five million bucks out of your bank well yeah that would help a, a handful of people maybe i don't know that it would help them it'd probably ruin their life more than help their life if they weren't prepared to do to to receive that money you can't yeah i don't think that would be a good way to go but but you want to help and you think well we have some money here. Uh, there's got to be something we can do to kind of help make the world a better place because I love human beings and you do too. And maybe we could get together and do some stuff and make the world a better place. Wouldn't that be a smart, good thing to do? And so we decide, okay, let's, let's each put in $50 billion. And, you know, of course, by now our 200 billion, because we have smart financial advisors at that point, it's grown to 220 uh, billion at this point. So we're plenty fine to each toss in 50 billion into this, this fund, we'll call it a, a fund a, um, and then we get some other people like us, some other billionaires. Hey, will you guys toss it into, and let's say we end up with a, a, a pot of $200 billion again, that's just coincidence. Another a pot of $200 billion to go out and do some cool stuff. And so let's say we, we invest that money so that we're not actually eating into it. We're just gonna, you know, do our good stuff out of the interest we earn at, let's say 5%. So 5% at that um, is $10 billion a year. So we're gonna have a $10 billion a year budget to go out and do great things in the world. And so now we're thinking about what is it that we're going to do? Um, how, how are we going to go about this? And so we think we need to get a bunch of good people to work in this organization. What are good people worth? Well, you know, a, a good secretary is 50 grand a year and a good public relations person might be 300 grand a year and a, a good doctor, 200 grand a year, 300 grand a year. But you know, we're going to average it out and just say uh, $200,000 uh, per year salary. Um, to for each of our team members and you know yeah some will be more some will be less but for just rough numbers that'll work so 200 grand a pop for our people so if we say you know what let, let's just spend 20 percent of our annual income uh on these people let's let's spend you know 10 billion a year uh well that's 10 billion is our whole budget so we're going to spend 2 billion on personnel costs so that would give us ten thousand awesome employees. And we're going for the cream of the crop here. You know, when I when I said the average of 200,000, I think I could have said an average of 100,000, but we want to get better people. So we're saying 200 grand per person. So now we have 10,000 employees. And of course these things aren't instantly happen happening, but we're setting them into we're set, we're getting the ball rolling and, and making them happen. We're hiring the CEO to kind of make sure it all happens and the board of directors and all that kind of stuff. And so as we're onboarding these new awesome people, our attorneys and our writers and our computer programmers and, and our public relations people, our psychologists, all these folks, as we're onboarding them, uh, I'm not going to say we're brainwashing them, but we are using advanced psychological methods to train them to understand and appreciate our philosophy. Uh, and whatever it is that our worldview philosophy is, whether it's voluntarism or Marxism or 
uh, whatever it is, we're making sure that we get our folks really on board so they believe in the cause. And, and I think that's important. You know, you think about some organization who travels around the world uh, showing natives how to get clean water out of the dirt, um, how to build filters and such. Well, you kind of have to have a passion for helping people to be good at that job. And you have to kind of be on board with the idea that eh, it's a good idea for people to have clean water instead of dirty water. And so we would want the people in our organization to be uh, smart and and knowledgeable about what it is that they are doing, that that our mission and our goal is, and we'd want them to be on board. So we'd put a lot of good effort into getting them trained up, so, you know, maybe send them to Mises Institute for a week uh, and, and just wine them and dine them and have them have a great time and feel good, make connections with philosophers and other good people, et cetera. Um, and, you know, and that's just if we were interested in uh, Austrian economics. But, you know, whatever our worldview was, we would really make sure our people were on board and passionate disciples uh, in addition to being employees. And I think it would be smart to kind of do what countries do and churches do and, and like get these people to understand that what they're working for is better, bigger than just themselves. Like we are making the biggest coordinated effort in the history of humankind to make the world a better place. Like never have this many well-intentioned people got together to really truly do a good job making things happen and we'd have everybody feel proud about it and we'd have t-shirts and chants and and you know uh, pledges and all this stuff to really help build the team we'd use the latest psychological techniques what does a military do to get people to bond with each other what do churches do to get people to bond we'd kind of put all that together have our psychologist decide how all that will be done and really get the people to be a powerful force that are passionate about doing good. Okay, and so now we, we were, we're spending uh, two billion on personnel costs, on salaries and such, and we have eight billion left. And, and we're, we're kind of talking and we're saying, you know, uh, people are impressed with rich people like us. And, you know, when you meet somebody who is a, a very, very wealthy person, uh, everybody is kind of excited. So even the person who hates I don't know, like right now, 2023, there are a lot of people, I'm not going to use Biden as an example. I'm going to use somebody who is, I don't know, sane or cognizant or whatever, not Trump. Um, I, trying to think of somebody, I can't think of anybody in politics, but uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, how about uh, Jeff Bezos? Jeff Bezos is really wealthy and you might not like Amazon, you might not like what he's done, you might not exactly like him, but you'd have to kind of admit that you go to a restaurant and they're really tight on seating and they're like, hey, would you guys mind sharing a table? And you end up getting to have a meal with Jeff Bezos. Like afterward, you'd be kind of like proud and telling all your friends, oh my gosh, you're not gonna believe who I had dinner with. And it would be kind of a cool experience, even if you never liked Jeff Bezos. He's just, of course, an example. But that's kind of the way most of us think of wealthy people. We're like, whoa, we're just in awe of them. Well, you and me, <laughs> the, the folks who have each put $50 billion into this, this program, um, people feel that way about us now. And like, oh my gosh, there's Shepard. You know, oh, I heard that he has a jet that's so big that blah, blah, blah. You know, all these rumors and just everybody's so excited. And oh, I got to see him driving by once. You know, there's this whole kind of fan club thing going on. Um, and, and maybe if we're not social media influencer kind of folks, we're not out there trying to do it, maybe it wouldn't be as much. But Warren Buffett isn't out there sending a bunch of tweets. But people know about him and they care about what he has to say because he's really wealthy and he has some some advice to give from time to time. So I think they'd be the same with us. And then we also notice that not only are people impressed with us, but we think back to the 80-20 rule and we realize that 80% of the world's population are not that bright. Uh, the, the smartest 20% makes up the real movers and shakers and the people who can think a little bit more deeply and critically about things. That bottom 80% of the world uh, world's population, <clears throat> that 5.6 billion people, they are going to be so easy to get to just follow along with whatever we do. We just we have to present it well, but they're the ones that that see the commercials and then we'll go and buy a Big Mac because it has lettuce and lettuce is healthy. You know, they're the ones who uh, idiocracy was made about. And they're not, I'm not saying they're bad people. They're just your average school teacher, police officer, postmaster, th these people. Are, they're not like purposefully bad, evil people. They're just 
not that bright. They're in the bottom 80%. So yeah, that's, that's just who they are. And we know that we can really kind of get them to do what we want if we approach it intelligently. Okay, so now we're months or a year or whatever into it. We have our 10,000 awesome people who are kind of waiting for something to do. And we've been feeding them our philosophy. We've been feeding them uh, good books. We've been, we have been making sure that they understand uh, things like the Bernays Reader. They understand propaganda and public relations and especially our top tier of our, the planners of us, uh, those of us toward the top of the organization. We're really studying this kind of stuff. And we're thinking, you know, we need to give our 10,000 people a practice run just to kind of get work out all the kinks and find the problems and, you know, fix some stuff up. So we decide, hey, what's a big problem facing people? Well, back pain is a big, big issue facing people. And we say, you know, let's say we find out that 40% of people in America are facing back pain. We're going to focus on America just as our practice run. And we that's what we're going to have have be our practice thing. But then at the same time, try to do some good and help people's backs uh, not hurt so much. Okay, and let's say we, we do a little research. We find out there's such a thing as ridge bumps that are these little bumps in the inside the sole, the insole inserts that you put into shoes. Um, and, and these things just really seem to help. However, they're uncomfortable and people haven't liked them and no company has really been able to mass produce and get them out there. You know, a few little things have tried, eh, they just kind of fizzled out and eh, never worked out. But we kind of have done a little bit of research and it looks like it would really truly help people's backs feel better. If we could fix their posture by having these special soles on their shoes, that would be, yeah, that'd be something that could really help, help people and not have back pain. And everyone who has tried this in the past has tried to use logic and reason. And, and of course, the bottom 80% of people, that's not how they think. That's absolutely useless. Um, so they're just not buying it. They're not going for this thing, even though it would make absolutely good sense to do it. They're not doing it. So we have our, our researchers find out that 95% of the shoes in the world are made by 10 companies. 10 big companies make up 95% of shoe production. And so we decide, okay, we, we need to get to know these folks. And so we again bring in our psychologists, our neuro-linguistic programmers, uh, programming folks, and, and we, we make sure everybody's read modern persuasion strategies. And we, we know how to communicate with people and get them to like us and be on our side. And so we form relationships with the top, uh, top folks in these 10 biggest companies that make up 95% of shoe sales in the, in the world. And so in reaching out to them, hey, it turns out that you and I as new billionaires have been brushing shoulders. And we actually have seen seven of these 10 uh, CEOs at various events around the world. And, you know, it's not not strange for the person who owns a huge shoe brand. I don't know, Nike, I don't know if it's public or not, but it's it's not strange for that CEO to be at the same place as Elon Musk. They're all kind of in that top crust. And so, yeah, we we happen to know or have friends who know seven of them. And so we talk to them, we talk to the others. And in the long run, we get 80% of these companies to agree um, to, to go well, go along with us, help the world be a better place. And, and shoe companies aren't going to make less money because people's backs are doing better. Um, it's not like a pharmaceutical company where you kind of want a lifelong customer. This is something where, yeah, it doesn't hurt you to actually solve the problem. So shoe companies are on board. We're doing great. And so then our other folks, our recruiters have been reaching out to the sports folks. And so that, you know, we, we, we look at the top 20 soccer players and football players and basketball and, and football, whatever the most watched sports are. And we're reaching out to these top 20 folks. And let's say we can get half of them to come on board and want to help us with this project. So now we've got them on board. Okay, and let's say we weren't really voluntarists and we were going to use the political system. Um, and so we, our lobbyists have been talking to the politicians and we've been getting them on our side to, to start realizing what a problem back pain is and how wonderful we are to want to help it. And we're whining and dining them and making donations and eh, just buttering them up as well. And, and this is a, not just at the top level, but, you know, we're, we're, we have mayors of, of major cities and we have city council people and, and we have governors and state senators and federal senators. And people are really liking us because our lobbyists have been reaching out, our public relations folks, and yeah, they've been doing a good job with them. And our public relations people have been working on the press as well. We formed some new thing. I don't know, the, the Southeastern Press Leadership Synopsis or, or what's that called when people get together? Convention, whatever, symposium, not synopsis. <laughs> and so we have 
this symposium and 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 we bring in all these these press folks and we give out awards and we have famous YouTubers there to make them laugh and and it's just a grand old uh, weekend of great fun and bonding. Man, they uh, just love us to death. The press is on our side. They love us. They're going home with their awards, with their swag. And yeah, now we've got the press on our side. And at the same time, our group uh, of 10,000 employees, we have found influencers, let's say 50 good influencers who have suffered from back pain. And among those are, you know, a football player, uh, an actor, a firefighter who is a hero in the community, but hasn't been able to be as good at his job because uh, because of back pain and, and really wants to help the community, though. And and you know, people who are, you know, at, at the top of their financial game, but then back pain has caused them to have a big lull and they're not doing as well anymore. And with these influencers, we're not telling them that we are from this organization and we're trying to have this big master plan of a conspiracy that we're trying to get them on our team to do stuff. They don't think they're working with us. They just think they're kind of our friends or the handlers, part of the 10,000 people who work for us. Uh, those handlers are handling these influencers and they don't really think that they're part of any big conspiracy or anything. There's, there's no such thing. They're just all friends and that, that's how they basically think about it. And we're we're helping them encouraging them to make comments on their their whatever platform they're on about how much back pain has harmed them and and you know how it's how it's so annoying and that they're not not able to do what they wish they could and that it's a real problem and they're starting to really get it out there so that the the whole country is starting to think about back pain for real like it's it's becoming yeah, I'm not I'm not going to say that it's trending or anything but it's it's getting up there and people are starting to starting to pay attention to it. And an example of this would be, there are things like Black Lives Matter, that Black lives have always mattered, as have other colored lives, uh, like white or brown or whatever. Their lives have always mattered, but it seems like people really thought they mattered for a, I don't know, six to 12 month period a few years ago. And now I don't hear people talking about it. Well, I happen to think everybody's life still matters, but it's not at the forefront of what people are talking about. So we would just make sure that back pain became something that was at the forefront of, of the conversation, the national conversation. And we would be pulling some other strings, uh, podiatrists uh, who, who, were never famous before. Well, now they're starting to be more famous. You know, they're the the popular YouTubers are having them on to talk, and and they're talking about back issues and uh, how shoes can be a, a solution. And th there are these educational things happening. The Rotary Clubs uh, Breakfast Rotary Clubs uh, guest who's going to talk to them for twenty minutes. Uh, that person happens to be a podiatrist who talks about uh, shoes and how they relate to back problems and hey, do y'all have back problems? Yeah, me too. You know, okay. So it's really, really getting out there now. And of course, these Rotarians that are listening to this talk and then going home and telling their spouse, yeah, well, what happened at Rotary today? Oh, we had this interesting guy, this doctor, and he's really cool, um, talking about how um, how back pain is often caused by bad shoes or could be corrected by having better shoes. And these people, neither the Rotarian who came home that day nor the, that person's spouse realize that, oh yeah, they also heard about back pain on a podcast the day before. And, oh, they also heard a sportscaster on ESPN mentioning it. They, they wouldn't even realize that all of a sudden, people are talking about back pain and that hadn't been talked about before. They're not going to notice. This is what Bernays taught people how to do. It's what he did. It's what public relations does. And at the same time, our companies, our shoe companies, the uh, eight of them that are on board, or let's say we only had seven, whatever, they are putting out press releases that have been written by our uh, propaganda experts uh, just saying, hey, you know, our, our company exists to help people. And, you know, we're we're really wanting to help this. And we're on the cutting edge of some technology. It's sustainable and inclusive. And it, it's this type of soul that could really help people. But it's just a really tough process. And gosh, we hope we're going to be able to get this to come out. And 
you know, please be thinking about us and, and sending good thoughts our way. And we're really trying to come up with a solution. And so these press releases, you know, that you know, variations of that are going out. And so now people are, oh, yay, Nike's working on this problem that we just heard about on the Theo Vaughn podcast. And, and now it's just being talked about even more. Um, and we're working it. We're working this thing. Our 10,000 people are seeing what works, what doesn't work. And we are, we're making it happen. And maybe some of the politicians who are our friends are talking about putting up some legislation. Maybe they're doing a press release that they're looking into some legislation about um, companies that are putting out shoes that are harming people's backs and how, you know, maybe there needs to be some regulation on these things because so far there hasn't been any regulation and look at how bad people's backs are and it's time for a solution and that kind of stuff. And maybe these politicians are also in, encouraging their colleagues to to kind of gloss over some of the FDA requirements or whatever it would be for shoe shoe soles insoles, um, and they're saying, well, yeah, why don't we skip some of these things and let's let them call it a medical device, even though maybe it technically isn't. And, and they're they're kind of coming along, and, and they're they're working on the political end of things as well. And meanwhile, some colleges are now offering courses in. Uh, B uh, podiatry back pain management and blah 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 and and now it's just becoming this this national conversation uh, about back pain and, and its relationship to shoes by this time 98 percent of the people who have heard about the whole back pain shoe shoe solution thing uh 98 of them are thinking oh it must be a real deal if I heard about it from wherever then it's got to be a real deal and anybody who thinks it isn't is just a wacko. Um, they are really out there. Um, anybody who says that maybe it's not as big of a deal as is being made out to be, or that there's some conspiracy about it or something, um, they're like, yeah, it turns out those friends are probably also a, a Z28.310. So really, should you listen to that kind of person? Yeah. And so pretty soon, our companies who are on our team, they're coming out with these, uh, these shoes. And it is it is working people are happy and even if it's not working you know it's only another 79 bucks to buy these shoes and uh that's that's not my like you're not going to get upset if that doesn't fix all of your woes you hope it does and it actually is helping a lot of people and uh I, people are just excited about it. It's working. And and, and again, if, if it's not working, like there are so many other more important things happening in the world that you're not going to be focusing on that, sh that, that a particular shoe didn't solve your problem. Um, Prince Kardashian is too worried about Keisha's nip slip and, and what Brad Pitt is saying about it or what, like that kind of stuff is so much more important that that is what everybody's focusing on. And they're not really deeply examining the claims made by the shoe company or whether or not they worked. Okay, so I, I'm just kind of giving you an idea of, of this campaign, and I'm not going to keep going on about this right now, but you see how we could kind of sort of make something happen. You can see how we could do some campaigns to put down the two or three big shoe companies who didn't join us on our thing and make them look bad. Um, well, unlike them, we care, you know, that kind of stuff. Continue thinking about this this scenario that I just came up with uh, about shoe soles solving back pain being the practice thing. Continue that on. We get what we want out of it. We decide how we can best manipulate people. How did how did we get the politicians to come on board? What tactics did we use that made them hate us and not want to come on board with us? And this was all just a big practice run. Who really cares? Yeah, maybe. Back pain is now, after we've done this whole thing, another survey is done, another study is done, and only 30% of the people say they suffer from back pain instead of the initial, what did I say, 40, 45%, whatever. Okay, so we've made a measurable difference. We've moved the needle. We've made the world a better place by doing this kind of conspiring behind the scenes to make things happen. So when I think about us doing this, we do our shoe example, then we go out and really start doing things that we care more about. And maybe we're right or wrong about those things. We're probably both on, on some, uh, but it doesn't really matter. We're out there trying to make things happen. And so with this organization that I talked about that you and I came up with to try to do good, neither of us had evil intentions. We're just trying to do good. I have to think that if you and I would think of doing this, or if I just thought of this idea, maybe the people who really do have a lot of money have also 
sat around together and said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could spend some of our money like genuinely making the world a better place? I think it's reasonable to think that they would have said that. Um, I think it's reasonable that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett might hang out together and Warren Buffett says, hey, I'm not real good at helping people or any of that stuff. So I'll just hand over a bunch of money to the Gates Foundation and let Bill, who seems really passionate about this stuff, I'll let him handle it. I don't know that that's a conspiracy, but it's kind of like minds working together. And then I'll, I'll read the quote that George Carlin made that I really like. You don't need a formal conspiracy when interests converge. These people went to the same universities and fraternities. They're on the same board of directors. They're in the same country clubs. They have the same interests. They don't need to call a meeting. They know what's good for them and they're getting it. George Carlin. I think that that is possible. So I don't know that all of these peas working together, that it's some big conspiracy, but I have to think that maybe there could be some people at the top pulling strings and making things happen. I have to think that these planners might have a little bit of organization going to do this kind of thing. Um, I, I have to think that George Soros and Susan Gore aren't the only people who are willing to, to look deep into their heart about what it is they care about and then put some of their fortune into making good things happen, what they understand to be good things. And maybe with Bill Gates, he thinks the world is better off with 500,000 people, uh, rather, or 5 million, whatever it is, rather than 7 or 8 billion. And so wouldn't he try to do that in as nice and polite and, polite and gentle and kind of a way as possible? Um, he really thinks that that's going to be better? Well, should he just sit on his butt and do nothing to help the world? I mean, maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong, but shouldn't we all go out and try to do good stuff? So that's just something to get your brain spinning and thinking. Maybe I'm completely out in, in, in the pasture here. Maybe I'm completely wrong. There's nothing to what I have to say. Maybe I'm just a complete nuts, nut, nut job here. Um, let me know what you think. What am I missing? Uh, what should I add to this thought? Again, this problem of the peas is just, this is the first time I've, I've put it out publicly and I would like some feed, uh, feedback on it. And then I'm going to try to hone in on it and make it a little bit a little bit more understandable than I poorly explained today and uh, yeah, see if there's something to it or if there isn't. Thank you so much for taking your valuable time to listen to this, to, to watch me or more importantly, listen uh, to some of the thoughts and ideas I have and to call me out on it uh, and let me know if I'm right or wrong. Thank you for your support and hopefully we'll have uh, some more videos coming out in 2024.